Welcome back. Uh, so we talked about some basic properties of syntax last time, and I sort of outlined a, uh, a very simple empiricist uh, minimal theory of syntactic learning that we might want to adopt as a first pass here. Um, what, would, what did that theory say? Well, it said that children, just like they do for learning sound patterns and learning words in their language, they track uh, the probability of different elements following one another. In this case, it would be words within phrases or within sentences. Um, and they generalize from that uh, to say that uh, things with high probability, things that occur together often, tend to be cohesive linguistic units or syntactic constituents in this case. Uh, whereas things that occur next to each other less frequently are probably not part of the same linguistic unit. And that could start you off towards learning where the constituents are within a string of words in your language. Right? And so the thing that's nice about that theory uh, is that it just relies on these domain general uh, statistical learning and pattern recognition kinds of capabilities. And we know that humans have those. We know that children and infants already possess the ability to do statistical learning and pattern recognition over not just language, but over pretty much anything, right? Uh, so if that's how we're going to get into break into the syntax, that's great because it means that uh, we don't need to posit any kind of special uh, language-specific innate machinery, right? any kind of uh, UG, anything like that, we can just learn from observing uh, the way that words tend to follow one another in the environment around us in our primary linguistic data or a linguistic input, um, and from that we can get a notion of constituency that will allow us to start forming generalizations about a grammar. So if that were the way that syntactic learning worked, then everybody would be happy. Right? Uh, but here's a problem. Uh, if you could find some bit of grammatical implicit knowledge, um, some form of uh, grammatical knowledge that every native speaker, every mature learner, every mature knower of a grammar uh, possesses, but for which there is little or no evidence in the linguistic input they've been exposed to, right, that would be a problem for this theory. So if people end up knowing things implicitly, if they end up having generalizations in their grammars uh, that reflect uh, elements of grammar that you couldn't have recovered from just listening to the sequences of words around you, um, that would be problematic for this empiricist learning theory. Um, and of course, people have uh, posited precisely such cases, or else I wouldn't be making this point. Um, Chomsky's name for these cases, which we briefly took a look at when we when we looked at chapter one of, it, of aspects of the theory of syntax earlier this semester, he calls these cases the poverty of the stimulus, where the stimulus here is the linguistic input, or he sometimes calls it the primary linguistic data that an infant or a child gets about their language. Um, and the claim is that sometimes that input is too poor, there's just not enough of it, or it doesn't have enough details, or it's too degraded uh, to actually uh, allow us to infer all of the detailed syntactic knowledge that we end up having about our native language. Right? So that's what poverty of the stimulus means. Um, and I wanted to go through several examples of this. I'll start with some of the examples from uh, this chapter by Ray Jackendoff from his uh, book, Foundations of Language. Um, where he talks about some probably the stimulus examples that are a little bit unusual. They're not sort of the classic examples that get trotted out within the narrow syntactic component. We're going to look at those classic examples in the next few lectures. Um, but Jackendoff has some slightly different examples here that I think are interesting. Uh, and this first one is a little bit tricky and subtle, um, but it involves uh, what's referred to as quantifier scope. So what is quantifier scope? Well, quantifiers are these words like every a, some, uh, most, things like that uh, in English that modify nouns and that talk about um, sets of the things that those nouns denote, right? So for every, uh, every acorn uh, denotes something like the set of all acorns or all relevant acorns in our discourse versus um, an oak here uh, where that indefinite article is a quantifier that denotes um, <clears throat> the existence of at least one uh, oak tree or something like that. So these are denoting sets of entities and there's a relationship here. There's an interesting ambiguity. Uh, anytime you have two quantifiers in a sentence, uh, it matters logically which one has what's called a wider scope than the other, right? So in 3a here, every acorn grew into an oak. Uh, if 
the universal quantifier, every, has a wider scope than the existential one, A, uh, then the reading that we'll get here, the meaning that we'll get is, for every acorn in the world, uh, there exists an oak such that the acorn grew into the oak. Now, there could be another order of quantifier scope in here. It's not possible for this particular sentence, um, but you could imagine a reading here where you would reverse the order or the scope of those quantifiers, um, and that would mean something like uh, there exists an oak such that every acorn in the world grew into that oak. Right? This is nonsensical. Right? It would say that there's like a single uh, mother oak tree that every single acorn in the universe ends up being, which doesn't really make any sense uh, given what we know about uh, the world around us, but that would be the sort of inverse scope reading with wide scope for the existential quantifier and narrow scope for the universal one. Instead, the natural reading that we get from this is going to be where uh, the universal quantifier every, uh, we say it scopes over uh, the existential one. So for each acorn, uh, that acorn uh, has some kind of an oak that exists and it grows into that oak. It, it can be different oaks for each acorn. Uh, similarly in 3b here, every oak grew out of an acorn. If I were going to paraphrase that, I would say uh, for every oak there exists some acorn uh, such that that oak grew out of that acorn. And we wouldn't get the inverse scope here. Um, so these make sense so far. If we think that the universal quantifier every is in subject position of these sentences, it's going to be higher in the syntactic tree, um, and so the scope that it takes is also going to be higher if we use the syntax uh, to understand the meaning of sentences, which we probably do. Right? Now look at 3c here. An oak grew out of every acorn. This is interesting because we've now reversed the structural position of the two quantifiers where we have the existential, existential quantifier in the higher position here, in subject position, and the universal one in lower position, yet apparently we're able to get the inverse scope reading here. So if I were going to paraphrase this, I would still say uh, the meaning is basically the same as the other sentences. For every acorn, there exists some oak such that that oak grew out of that acorn. So this is not a single uh, oak tree. Uh, it's instead different oak trees for every acorn, right? And this is no problem in English. It's, it's uh, no problem to get this reading. Perfectly good way of saying this in English. So it looks like sometimes uh, we're allowed to have what's called inverse scope, right? Where the object quantifier takes wider scope than the subject one. But in 3D, for whatever reason, we can't do this, right? So an acorn grew into every oak that can only carry the nonsensical meaning uh, with uh, the surface scope that we see in the sentence where the existential quantifier is high and the universal one, every, is low here. So the only meaning that can correspond to that is there exists a single acorn uh, such that for every single oak tree in the world, uh, that one acorn eventually grew into every single oak tree in the universe, which really doesn't make much sense. That's why there's an asterisk here. Um, I actually wouldn't use an asterisk for that sentence. I would use, uh, we sometimes use a pound sign for, for uh, these sentences that are grammatical. That's part of the English language. It just doesn't make much sense given what we know about the world. Um, and so the observation here is that you can't get that sentence to work um, in the same way that 3C works. And that's baffling, right? There's no obvious explanation for that. Um, it looks like there's just some asymmetries between these different predicates involving the verb grow. So grow into and grow out of. Um, are these two separate sort of verb particle constructions in English, um, and it looks like there's just some weird asymmetry be between where uh, a quantifier is allowed to scope out of its object noun phrase and where it isn't allowed to. Um, so that's going to be an extremely subtle fact about English syntax, um, and as far as Jack and Doff knows, and this seems right to me, every native speaker of English, every adult, has this paradigm in three here. This is, these are very, very clear categorical facts about how English sentences can be interpreted. Um, so his question is, what on earth could we have been exposed to uh, as children that would allow us to learn this kind of a thing from our, from our uh, English input? Because we're certainly not being exposed to paradigms like this, right? And the normal thing we'd expect is that if we see uh, 3A and 3B and 3C, 
uh, you would naturally expect, and we've learned that all of these are possible, right, by observing them around us, you would expect the infant to generalize this to 3D2, right? Because there's absolutely no reason if you can get scope in place, as in 3A and 3B, and you can get inverse scope when you have uh, an existential uh, in the subject and a universal in the object, as in 3C, then you ought to be able to do the exact same thing in 3D. There's nothing structurally very different about 3C and 3D, yet somehow we all end up knowing that 3D uh, is not possible with its sensible reading, uh, while 3C is perfectly fine. Um, and his point is that when you see other kinds of reversible predicates like this, um, and in particular, transitive verbs would be a good example, um, you expect the child to generalize, right? And most of these predicates are fully uh, reversible. So if you can see the cow bit the horse, and that's fine, and you can see the horse bit the cow, and that's fine, um, and then there's some way to reverse the predicate so that the subject and the object end up in different structural positions, switching places with each other, as in the passive construction in 4E here, uh, the horse was bitten by the cow, then you expect that reversal operation to be fully applicable in either direction, as in 4D, and it is in these cases. So if you can do the cow bit the horse and the horse bit the cow, and you can do the horse was bitten by the cow, which changes the structural position of these noun phrases, but doesn't change the meaning from the corresponding active sentence, then you can do the same thing with 4D. The cow was bitten by the horse, and uh, you would expect that if children are seeing um, a, a, B, and C here, sorry, that is not an E, it's just a, a strangely uh, copied C. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you can do four A, B, and C, then you would fully expect infants to, to assume that you can also do four D. Somehow that fails to happen in three here, and that is a mystery. It's, it's unclear what kind of uh, information a child would need to be exposed to in order to ever have learned that. So this is Jack Enough's example where he doesn't necessarily have a nice solution to this problem, but he's just pointing out there is a really weird learning puzzle here, and we, we're not anywhere close to being able to explain how a child could learn this from the data. Um, so he's not going to solve it, but he is pointing out an interesting problem. And these, this is the character that a lot of Poverty the Stimulus examples have, um, is that there's these extremely subtle and tricky facts about grammar um, and you'd either need incredibly specific information or input in order to learn it, um, or you'd uh, need to sort of actively be told about negative evidence, um, yet there's no evidence that children actually receive that input. So how do we come to know all of these things, at least implicitly, as adults? That's the general flavor uh, of poverty, the stimulus examples. Um, the next one is a classic not actually from linguistics, but from philosophy, and I think I've briefly... Um, discussed this one earlier uh, in class when we talked about empiricism and rationalism, um, and it, it's due to the philosopher W.V.O. Quine, um, and it's sometimes referred to as the Gavagai problem, although its more formal academic name is uh, the radical indeterminacy of translation, is what Quine called it. Um, so what is the Gavagai problem? Well, it's sort of a thought experiment, so imagine you're, hey, let's say you're a, a linguist, or maybe a pre-linguistic infant, um, and you've, you're out in uh, you know, a completely foreign culture where you don't know anything about the culture or the language, um, and you're trying to learn the language around you, or maybe you're trying to document it as a linguist or something like that, and so you're out with a hunter, um, and the hunter is showing you things around the jungle, um, and there is uh, a bunny rabbit running across a field, and a uh, hunter points at it and goes, Gavagai. So uh, the question here is, uh, what does Gavagai mean? And people tend to have, um, you know, intuitions about this. But the question is really, why do you have those intuitions? Or what are some possible things that Gavagai could mean here? So maybe take a second, pause the video, think about all the possibilities for what Gavagai could mean. Okay, so most people, at least English speakers, tend to have the uh, intuition that Gavagai probably means rabbit. Um, so there's a fluffy white rabbit there, and it's running across a field, and um, he points and says, Gavagai, and you think, oh, that must mean rabbit. And for whatever reason, that word rabbit, that level of categorization, uh, because a word exists in English and because it's, uh, we tend to classify animals by their species, roughly species, um, we think maybe Gavagai means rabbit. 
But of course, there's a, a lot of other things gavagai could mean. Maybe it means animal. Maybe it means animal that you could eat. Uh, maybe it means white thing. Maybe it means furry thing. Maybe it means white furry thing. Uh, maybe it means uh, living thing. Maybe it means thing that's moving, right? So it could be an incredibly specific word. Maybe it means this particular rabbit that I sometimes see in here, right? Uh, maybe it means um, a particular rabbit that is running around in a field and is white and furry, right? Maybe that's what Gavagai means. Maybe it's something incredibly specific. Or on the other hand, it could be anything incredibly general. Maybe it's physical object. Maybe it's thing that I can see, right? Uh, so all the way, there's a continuum from the most general possible meaning that this could have to the most specific possible meaning that it could have. And this continuum is actually infinite, right? Given that any physical object in any situation has uh, an infinite number of properties, uh, there is correspondingly an infinite number of possible meanings that this word could have. So just observing a word being used in a context, right? it's always going to be infinitely ambiguous what that word means. Um, so when Quine originally brought this up, I think his point was actually about translating from one language to another. And his point was that you can't do it uh, because you'll never actually know that a word in one language means the same as that word in another language. So translation is indeterminate according to this argument. But actually it's a much broader argument and it's about uh, linguistic meaning in general, right? So if it's true that you can't translate a word because its meaning is indeterminate, it's equally true that you shouldn't be able to learn a word from pure uh, empiricist observation because there will always be an infinite number of possible word meanings to correspond to that word, right? So you'll never actually be certain what the word means. So if you think about generalizing this situation, it's like every single second of every day you're running into another situation with a white rabbit where somebody says gavagai, it's different physical objects and different physical events and different strings of sounds, but every single time you're going to have the exact same problem, which is that there's an infinite number of possible meanings. Right? So Quine takes this as an argument that meaning actually is indeterminate and that we can't ever be sure um, that what anything means, what any word means. Um, and linguists tend to take a slightly different lesson from this, right? And they start from the assumption that we actually know that children solve the Gavagai problem because we end up having stable word meanings in our grammars. Therefore, we can't be doing this through pure empiricist associationist learning. Right? So we must have some kind of learning bias uh, that guides us or forces us to pick particular levels of meaning as possible word meanings. There must be some constraints on what a possible word meaning is Otherwise, we'd never be able to solve the Gavagai problem, yet every human infant routinely solves this problem. Therefore, we must have some sort of innate learning bias uh, for what possible word meanings are like. Now, the exact nature of those biases is a little bit less clear. I haven't put a big uh, at part of this class um, in the word learning literature because it's very, very big and very complicated. But suffice it to say, there seems to be very strong constraints on what kinds of strategies infants use in this word learning problem. Um, and it's not just pure cross-situational learning, as this is sometimes called. If you're just observing objects in various situations and trying to figure out what they have in common, that's a, a fully associationist, empiricist way of doing word learning. That's not what infants are doing. That's interesting. So they seem to solve the Gavagai problem by not considering all of those infinite possible meanings. So this would be another poverty of the stimulus example. We end up having clear, more or less clear word meanings, yet there's no way we could have learned that from the input. That's what the Gavagai problem says. Therefore, we must have come to the problem with some sort of innate bias. All right, so those are some sort of less standard poverty of the stimulus uh, <clears throat> examples. Um, here's a more classic syntactic one. This one's based on slides from my teacher David Pizetsky, and it has to do with what's called principle C of the binding theory. Um, don't worry about what any of that means if you haven't taken syntax yet. What the binding theory deals with um, is when different kinds of pronouns and um, non-pronoun noun phrases 
uh, which we call our expressions, are allowed to co-refer. What does that mean? They co-refer. Well, in one here, uh, the first sentence here, the lion will groom himself. Uh, the claim is that the noun phrase the lion and the pronoun himself, which is actually an anaphore, uh, that they can co-refer because they can both refer to the same individual. Right? So the lion is grooming uh, an animal. The animal that the lion is grooming is the same lion. That's what this means. The lion will groom himself. Right? Um, so in this case, we'd say that uh, the R expression, the lion, can co-refer with the anaphore himself. Um, <clears throat> Similarly, in two here, the lion will groom his fur. Uh, what about this possessive pronoun his? Who is that referring to? Well, in this case, um, it can refer to the lion. So the lion will groom uh, that same lion's fur, his own fur. Uh, could also re refer to another lion, but it's possible at least for it to refer to the same lion. Um, compare this to the third sentence here. He will groom the lion. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in this case, um, that pronoun he cannot refer to the same individual as the our expression, the lion, right? He will groom the lion can mean that some other person or some other lion is going to groom the lion, but it can't mean that the same lion uh, is grooming himself. Uh, similarly, uh, we can generalize this to sentences with more than one clause here. Um, so this is a sentence with an embedded uh, uh, clause, uh, complementizer phrase, he saw when the lion was in the box. Um, and again, um, <clears throat> that pronoun he is not allowed to co-refer with the R expression, the lion. Right? And so um, here I have uh, <clears throat> purposely written these sentences out, not with hierarchical syntactic structure, but just with a bunch of words in, in a row. Right? So they're numbered, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and the claim is that for these basic facts um, about when uh, the overt noun phrase or the R expression is allowed to have the same referent as the pronoun or the anaphore, um, these don't require any kind of complicated syntactic structure at all. Right? There's a very, very simple solution for um, uh, how this works. And the question is, um, what is the relationship between uh, the overt noun phrase, the lion, and all of these different pronominal and anaphoric forms, uh, what, what is the, exp uh, the relationship they have to be in for the two of them to refer to the same individual? Um, this is going to be the main question of the binding theory. Um, and the claim is that for these basic properties, you can solve these without any uh, complicated syntactic structure at all. Um, with just a string of numbered words. Um, so take a moment and see if you can figure out the super simple and easy. And for those of you who have taken syntax class, you might know that it's also wrong, but at least give me the simple generalization here about how this works. All right, so go for it. Okay, so coming back, um, the sort of easy solution to this, right? the question is, hey, when can the R expression, the lion, have the same referent as himself or his or he? Um, and the answer here is super simple, as long as the lion occurs before the co-referring element. So in the first two sentences here, the lion uh, is words one and two, so it's like the first element of the sentence. And then later on, at word five, we're getting these pronominal or anaphoric elements. So the lion, the R expression, comes before uh, the pronominal expression, and they're allowed to co-refer. The lion will groom himself, the lion will groom his fur. The difference between these and the last two sentences where these terms can't co-refer is that here the pronominal expression he is number one uh, and the lion is words four and five and so here he comes before the lion and they're not allowed to co-refer. So the simple very very easy solution that could be very, very easily learned from basic simple data of the kind that an infant would hear uh, the solution here is obvious. It's that in order for an R expression and a pronominal expression to co-refer, the R expression has to occur earlier in the sentence uh, than the pronominal expression and not vice versa. If the pronoun occurs before the R expression, then they're not allowed to co-refer. Super easy problem to solve. And then there's some trouble. So check out this extra sentence here, the fifth one down. Um, 
When he was here, the lion was angry. Uh, so interestingly here, the pronominal element he is number two, and it precedes the R expression, the lion, that's five and six, yet no problem with co-reference here. Very interesting. In order to see this, you basically need to have a sentence with an embedded clause with at least two clauses in it. So there's two clauses here. When he was here, the lion was angry. Um, and uh, this is a so-called reverse binding kind of sentence where you can get a pronominal element that precedes an R expression with which it co-refers. Right? So if we learn the simple, easy generalization from basic sentences like these, and even many more complicated sentences, um, what we're going to come out with is the obvious idea that an R expression needs to linearly precede uh, a, a pronominal element that it co-refers uh, with. But then that turns out to be wrong when you see these very complicated reverse binding kinds of expressions. Right? Yet every adult speaker of English uh, knows these facts perfectly well. There's very little evidence that children have trouble with these or make errors with them. So what could be going on here? Well, note that uh, if you learn the generalization from the basic data here, you're going to be wrong about these sentences. You're going to predict that these shouldn't be able to co-refer, yet every adult native speaker of English uh, knows that these are allowed to co-refer. Well, how did they learn that? Here's a much more complicated hypothesis about what's going on um, in uh, these basic data as well as, and this is going to solve the more complicated data as well, it has to do with the structural height of different elements in a syntactic tree, and in particular, uh, this relationship that's relevant here and in uh, many other parts of grammar is a structural notion referred to as C command. Uh, it doesn't matter what C command um, means. It's just denoting a relationship between nodes in a tree. And so in particular here, we say that any node x, where a node is any one of the letters in a tree like this, right? It's a point where, two, where more than one line comes together. Uh, so a node x c commands a node y if and only if x doesn't dominate y. That means x is not above y in the tree. And, but every node that dominates x also dominates y. So what does that mean? Well, in this tree, for instance, um, we can say that uh, k c commands n. Why is that? Because k is not above n in the tree. You can't trace lines down the tree to get from k to n. Uh, but every node that dominates uh, k here, which is just these two, j and a, all of these also dominate n, right? because you can trace a line down the tree from a and from j to n, just as you can to k, but you can't trace a line down the tree from k to n. So that's the formal definition of C command. Um, in more practical terms that are sort of easy to understand, uh, C command basically means uh, this node C commands its sister, the thing that's next to it, and everything underneath the sister. Um, and C command is also asymmetric. So uh, even though K C commands N in this particular case, um, N does not C command K. Why is that? Well, N doesn't dominate K, so the first part is good. Right? You can't trace a line down the tree to get from N to K. Um, but check this out. Every node that dominates N should also dominate K. Which nodes dominate N here? A, J, and L. Those are the ones that you can trace a line down the tree to N with. And A and J both dominate K, so so far so good, but L doesn't dominate K, therefore this one can't C command this one. So again, that's the formal definition, not super important. Uh, if you haven't taken syntax or if you're just not getting it, don't worry too much. The practical thing here is that um, a node C commands its sister and everything underneath the sister. Right? So here, D C commands only the node C. C C commands D and everything else underneath it. Uh, B C commands everything on this side of the syntactic tree underneath J. A C commands nothing in this tree, um, and so on and so forth. So C command turns out to be a super important uh, relationship in linguistic syntax, not just in English, but in every language that's been studied. Um, and it's going to be, in particular, important for talking about binding theory and talking about what we refer to here as principle C. Principle C is the part of the binding theory that deals with 
where full noun phrases or our expressions are allowed to appear uh, with co-referring pronouns. So check this out. Uh, the lion will groom himself, or the lion will groom his fur. These are the two easy examples we started with. Um, and the easy solution to these was, hey, the lion, this noun phrase, the R expression, occurs before uh, himself or his fur. And that was good enough, but that broke down later, that, that uh, excuse me, that approach. Um, so here's a much more complicated theory of why these two things are allowed to co-refer here. And we sometimes use these um, variables like I to show that we have um, co-reference, right? So this is the lion will groom his fur, where his is also marked I. That means these are meant to be referring to the same lion. If I put J here instead, I would be saying, hey, referring to a different lion. That would also be possible in this case, but we're more interested in the ones with co-reference. Um, and uh, it's true that the lion precedes these, but if that's not the right answer, we need to go to structure. What would be the structural relationship here? Well, here's a hypothesis um, that in order for uh, a full uh, noun phrase or an R expression to uh, co-refer with uh, a, uh, a pronominal or anaphoric element like himself or his fur, um, the R expression, the noun phrase, can't be C commanded by the pronominal phrase. So here uh, in the lion will groom himself, himself does not C command the lion, so we're good and they're allowed to co-refer. Uh, in his fur here, exact same thing. The noun phrase is down here. It doesn't see command the lion, and so no problem. Uh, so this is the condition on when uh, our expressions and pronouns are allowed to co-refer, um, as long as the our expression is not see commanded uh, by the pronominal element. Right? So that works for these simple examples. Um, here's why you can't get co-reference in he will groom the lion. And it's not even grammatical to say himself will groom the lion. So it's not a problem with agreement or something like that. It really is um, a, a, a property of how the words are ordered or structured in the sentence. And again, the simple solution here would have been to say, well, uh, here he precedes the lion, therefore you can't get co-reference. Um, but we're looking for a different approach because that one broke down eventually. So here again, is it the case that uh, the R expression is C commanded by its co-referent uh, Pronoun, it is in both of these cases. So here, he or himself, this noun phrase, C commands everything else in the clause down here. It's sister and everything underneath the sister. Um, and so uh, here, the R expression is C commanded by the pronoun. Therefore, the two of them can't co-refer. So this is going to be our principle C. Um, an R expression must not be C commanded uh, by the pronoun uh, that code refers with it, right? And here this is violated, therefore you can't have this reading of the sentence where uh, he and the lion refer to the same person. If we put a J on himself here, meaning some different guy is gonna groom the lion, that's no problem. But with uh, the same referent, with co-reference here, this is not possible, right? so that's principle C. So these are still the simple cases. Here's some more complicated cases, right? So even if you embed lots of multiple sentences underneath this, um, principle C is still going to hold. And this would be the same with linear order. This would also work with, uh, with the original solution, the simple one that says uh, what matters is whether the pronoun comes first or the R expression comes first. If the pronoun comes first, they can't co-refer. That's why this one doesn't work. He took the chickens when the lion was in the box. Claim here is that uh, he and the lion can't refer to the same individual here, there can't be co-reference, um, and either theory would get this one right. So the linear precedence one would get it right. C command would as well. Why? Because even though the lion is far away here from the pronoun that uh, co-refers with it, um, it's still the case that if you look at uh, the sister of this, it's this large, uh, it's the matrix clause, or the matrix sentence that contains everything else uh, underneath it or dominates everything else underneath it. So he here, does C command the lion? Uh, therefore, principle C says no co-reference here. Finally, we get to the tricky case, the reverse binding case, and this is where the original theory uh, that the R expression has to precede 
the pronoun, this is where this broke down. It doesn't work for this example. When he took the chickens, the lion was in the box. No problem in English for these to co-refer. In this sentence, it's fine for he and the lion to refer to the same animal. Right? So why is this? Well, our linear, linear order theory completely breaks down and makes the wrong prediction here. The C command theory still gets it right. Why is that? Well, if you look at the tree here, this noun phrase he, this pr pronoun he, uh, C commands everything in this initial clause, took the chickens, right? But it doesn't C command the lion. Uh, why not? Uh, because if it we're going to C command the lion, it would need to be the case that everything that dominates he also dominates the lion. But we have these extra nodes here in the syntax, this sentence or intonational, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, inflectional phrase and this complementizer phrase that's, that do dominate the pronoun he, but don't dominate the noun phrase the lion. You can't trace a path downwards in the tree from these nodes to this one. Therefore, this doesn't C command this. Therefore, the R expression is not C commanded uh, by the pronoun that co-refers with it. Um, and principle C says, no problem then. As long as this isn't C commanded by the pronoun, you can have co-reference. And this appears to be right. So things to appreciate here um, is that, first of all, this is a much, much, much more complicated theory of uh, where our expressions and pronouns are allowed to co-refer than the theory we started out with, right? So all else being equal, the linear order theory should be much, much better and easier and simpler to come up with. Um, this is the only case where the two theories make different predictions. Out of all the cases we've looked at, uh, the linear order theory almost always gets everything right and makes the same predictions as the structural theory, the C command theory. Um, and therefore, uh, the only, the crucial piece of evidence you need to see in order to know which theory uh, is, is the right theory is these backwards binding sentences, like when he was here, the lion was angry, knowing that he and the lion co-refer. Uh, so you need to see examples like this in order to differentiate which one of these is the right generalization about English syntax. By the time we're adults, and actually it turns out by the time we're three-year-old children, I'll, I'll show you the evidence for that briefly in the next uh, lecture, uh, we all know this. We don't have any problem getting co-reference in these sentences. So the question is, how did children learn this? Are they being exposed to tons of backwards binding examples like this? We don't have corpus data at the moment, but here's what I'm asking. Do you think that a lot of you know, one and two year old children are getting exposed to sentences like this with multiple clauses where one of the clauses um, is a sort of a, a parenthetical um, and then there's a matrix clause and the parenthetical has a pronoun in it and the matrix clause has an overt noun phrase and it's clear that the two of them co-refer. Are one and two year old children being exposed to lots of situations with sentences like that? Uh, the answer is almost certainly no. They probably would, have, would hear a vanishingly small number of these sentences in their first few years of life, yet by the time they're sort of, uh, you know, toddlers or, 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 or uh, you know, medium-aged children, every native English speaker appears to know all of these facts. And this doesn't make any sense because if you're mainly being exposed to sentences like this and this and this, and maybe even if you're being exposed to some more complicated sentences, some of them are going to be like this though, and all of these are consistent with the idea uh, that the relationship between an R expression and a pronoun is one of which comes first in the sentence, and that's what matters. So that ought to be the generalization that an intelligent learner would come to. We would expect English learning children uh, to learn the simple generalization because it's right for all of the easiest data and all of the data that they're actually being exposed to in real life. So the claim is that children are going to get tons of input like this, or maybe not tons, but some, right? They're going to hear sentences like these simple ones, you know, some of the time, uh, and maybe some complicated ones that will be like this, and very, very rarely any complicated ones that are like this. So if they're getting mainly linguistic input or primary linguistic data from their surroundings that are these simple examples, they ought to learn the simple rule. In order for a pronoun and an R expression to co-refer, uh, the 
our expression must come before the pronoun. That works for all of the simple data. Yet it appears to be the case that children do not learn that generalization. Instead, they learn the super complicated structural generalization that involves hierarchical structure and dominance relations and C command uh, and nodes in a syntactic tree and involves these super complicated hierarchical structures uh, for all of the sentences in question. Children seem to learn this instead of learning the simple rule even though they're mostly exposed to the simple data. So this is a mystery. And the question is, um, why would children learn the complicated structure-dependent hypothesis? Right? This hypothesis about C command is structure-dependent because it doesn't depend on which order the words come in in the sentence. It doesn't matter what, about the left to right order. It only matters about the hierarchical structure of the syntactic tree. Right? So that's a structure-dependent generalization. Uh, whereas uh, the simple one is not structure dependent at all, it's completely independent of structure. All you need to know is the order in which the words came in the sentence. Um, why are children ignoring the simple and mostly right structure independent generalization and instead learning the super complicated structure dependent generalization? Chomsky's answer um, is that structure dependence is part of universal grammar. So that whatever kind of language learning device a child has is simply incapable of learning structure-independent rules. It's only capable of learning structure-dependent ones because that's the way our syntactic learning is built. It's built to find structural generalizations, and it's not built in a way that allows it to generalize over the order of words in a sentence. That's Chomsky's claim. You literally can't learn structure-independent generalizations in linguistic syntax. Maybe in some other domain you can, but linguistic syntax is governed by a domain-specific system of innate learning biases. And one of the basic biases in that component is that we only induce generalizations over structural elements. We don't induce generalizations over the order of words in a string. So this is taken to be a universal and invariant property of all human languages and all rules and generalizations within human languages. It's referred to as structure dependence. Um, and this is uh, one of the basic properties that generative linguists think is in universal grammar. Um, so the claim is uh, <clears throat> basically uh, that you, you have a syntactic learning component uh, that uh, makes it impossible to learn structure-independent generalizations about word order and only allows you to learn structure-dependent generalizations about hierarchical syntactic structure. Um, and so there's lots of cases like this, we'll see several in this unit, uh, where there's a bunch of linguistic data and they're consistent with either a structure-dependent or a structure-independent generalization. And the structure-independent one is almost always simpler and easier to think of. Yet the claim from universal grammar is that in every case where you have available either a structure independent generalization or a structure dependent one, that children always learn the structure dependent generalization and they never learn the structure independent one. So we'll go into a little bit more detail about this in the next lecture.